Welcome everyone, this is Mark Ringo, Business Account Manager at FileMaker, and I'm your host for today's Getting Rid of Paper-Based Process web seminar, where you'll learn how FileMaker customers like Austin Convention Center, Ascend Aviation, McConnell's Ice Cream, SNG Seeds, and Penny Newman have leveraged FileMaker Go to replace paper. But before we get started, I have some brief housekeeping notes on the next slide. For best experience, we strongly recommend that you participate in this web seminar with at least a broadband connection. If you have any problems or require online assistance at any time, please contact Citrix Technical Support at 888-259-8414. Again, that number is 888-259-8414. During today's presentation, you'll have an opportunity to type in questions. We briefly, we talked briefly about how to answer a question. Go to the control panel, click on question section to reveal the question section, and enter your question and send. We'll cover as many questions as time allows at the end of our presentation. Next, I would like to talk about the FileMaker platform. The FileMaker business productivity platform is not just one product is a group of products and technologies that all work together. With the FileMaker platform, you can create custom business solutions on Windows and Mac with FileMaker Pro and FileMaker Pro Advanced. FileMaker Pro is our flagship product and it's what you use to build solutions. However, if you build solutions for a team of people, you'll want to use FileMaker Pro Advanced, which comes with power tools such as the script debugger, the data viewer, database design report, and allows for custom menus and much more. FileMaker Server is the hub of any successful FileMaker deployment, which allows you to host your FileMaker solution and provides automated backups and remote administration. And you'll need FileMaker Server to use our new FileMaker WebDirect, which is breakthrough web technology that runs custom business solutions directly in a web browser on a desktop or laptop with no web development skills required. FileMaker Go brings your FileMaker solutions to your teams on iPads, iPhones, and iPod touch devices. All your FileMaker solutions created with FileMaker Pro will simply work on these mobile devices. And best of all, FileMaker Go 13 is free on the App Store. Next, I would like to discuss the benefits of FileMaker Go. What if I were to tell you you can instantly update current inventory levels from the warehouse while scanning barcodes? What if you could capture digital signatures to close sales deals on the road? What if you could collect research data, including photos and audio files, in the field? What if you're able to swipe through patient records in the emergency room? And what if you can conduct teacher evaluations in the classroom. These are just some of the advantages of FileMaker Go. Next, I would like to discuss why our customers have gotten rid of paper. Paper is hard to share with remote workers. The information on paper becomes obsolete very quickly. Paper is a very manual process. Paper is not secure and storage of paper can become very, very costly over time. And the biggest problem we see with paper is you, more times than that, you're going to have multiple versions of the truth. On the next slide, I want to discuss the Austin Convention Center business use case. The Austin Convention Center transformed paper-based service order forms, work orders, and floor diagrams into a mobile application that provides a mobile workforce the ability to view, process, and reference event information across a facility that spans six city blocks. On the next slide, let's discuss how Austin Convention Center operated prior to FileMaker Go. The exhibitor's work orders were based solely on faxes and paper. The orders were keyed into a system, printed out and placed into a binder with diagrams and other paperwork to start deployment or fulfill changes. 
it was a very, very manual process. Next, let's look at how the Convention Center has become more efficient with FileMaker Go on iPad. The good news is the Austin Convention Center, they were already using FileMaker Pro um, as the billing system, so they could leverage the skill set that they already knew in FileMaker. They very quickly designed work order forms on the iPad. Employees now have real-time access to work orders, change orders, and floor diagrams, an easy-to-use touch interface on the iPad. This led to fewer errors, faster installs, and increased customer satisfaction. But the biggest benefit was the compelling return on investment. With FileMaker Go for iPad, the project payback was less than four months with an annual ROI of 200%. The estimate, estimated annual savings was 24,000. If you want more information on the Austin Convention Center business use case, please visit FileMaker.com under solutions and under customer stories. There's a great video that accompanies the success story. All right, on the next slide, I would like to introduce the team from Excel Assist today. We've got Doug, who's going to be presenting a couple of great use cases, Christo, the founder and president of the organization, and Kurt, who's the VP of Production Project Manager. Thank you, Mark. This is Doug, and uh, I'm going to give you all a few details about Excel Assist before we get started. Uh, the first of that being a photograph of us at FileMaker DevCon this year, a couple of weeks ago in San Antonio. So you can see some of the crew here. Um, Excel Assist was founded in 2001. We incorporated in 2004, so we've been around for quite a while. The, the company currently consists of five managing partners, um, three account managers, ten developers, and uh, six of those ten developers are already certified in FileMaker 13. A couple of those are scheduled to take the test soon, so we anticipate them passing as well. And we have a couple of uh, developers who specialize in web applications. Now, most of our group is cross-trained, and so they're all well-versed in a variety of development environments. We've been a proud member of the FileMaker Business Alliance for the last 12 years, and this spring we were promoted to platinum level by FileMaker Inc. We pride ourselves on out-of-the-box thinking, and we have seasoned developers and, and business professionals throughout the organization. Our agile development style is less formal and allows for faster changes with less overhead and less wasted time and effort. So we have clients ranging in size from a sole proprietor to large corporations with hundreds of users across the globe. We've worked with public and private sectors and we take ownership of our clients' problems. So whatever needs they have and whatever the nuances are of their business, we like to put ourselves in their shoes and really solve those problems from the inside out. So the first case study that we're going to look at today is Ascend Performance Materials, and specifically the Ascend Aviation Division within that company. So Ascend Performance Materials, uh, they, they're a premium provider of high-quality chemicals, fibers, and plastics. They have thousands of employees, and their products are used in a variety of applications. That, that ranges from turkey bags that you use for cooking the holiday turkey, to textiles for military and industrial clothing. The materials are also used in sporting equipment, household goods, wire connectors, cable ties, carpeting, all kinds of different applications. Um, so they have a wide variety of experiences in various markets. The, the picture in the bottom right actually shows uh, one of their Gulfstream jets in their Ascend Aviation Division. Their charter flight service is based out of Teterboro Airport in New Jersey and initially served their, just their own travel needs within the corporation, but they've branched out to some of their business associates as well. So, as you might have guessed, software solutions in this market are quite expensive, and they're not easy to adapt to differing business needs. So that's where FileMaker comes in. And when we look here on the left, we can see the forms that they were using previously. And when we started working with Brian, um, he's the head pilot at Ascend Aviation, these forms were used for recording all sorts of details about their flight expenses, uh, including their fuel consumption and the price they paid for the fuel, um, what method of payment they used, all kinds of different fees like uh, landing fees and ramp fees and parking fees and catering costs, all kinds of expenses associated with the trip. 
Um, but on occasion, the crew also had to stay overnight on these trips and make the return trip the following day. So they also track their hotel expenses and their meals and rental cars and all of that. Uh, now, that's a lot of paper. And we transition over to now the current approach, which is our FileMaker Go based solution. And, uh, you know, being tracked in the database, they connect to the hosted FileMaker server and the data is available to the main office in real time. So the passenger details and maintenance logs were also tracked on paper and flight itineraries for the passengers were printed in advance and sent to the, uh, to the passengers but then also provided to the crew. They'd carry them around on a clipboard so they knew what the meal preferences were and if there were any food allergies or anything like that. Um, but then last minute changes, obviously they had to cross it out and scribble in the new information. Um, so since the flight crew actually has Wi-Fi access on the plane at all times, they can now access the FileMaker solution from the cockpit of the airplane and just streamline the entire process. So they use FileMaker Pro in the office, they use um, FileMaker Go and WebDirect remotely, and the system looks the same across all devices. The core concepts that we were focusing on with this, uh, this project were to, um, you know, when transitioning away from the paper, we wanted to start small, we wanted to target the pain points first, and we wanted to make sure we were using our time effectively. So when starting small, we wanted to focus on the low-hanging fruit first. And in this case, the passenger itineraries, when mailing those to the passenger in advance, that's no longer necessary. Most people uh, wouldn't even expect that service from an airline anymore. So in, we can now just attach a PDF to an email instead of printing a copy and, and putting it in the snail mail. Uh, so it's an easy step toward what I, what I like to call paper prevention. If, if we stop the, the paper at the source, then we don't have to worry about scanning the documents later and archiving it because the paper never existed to begin with. And then identifying the pain points, you know, writing a few numbers on a clipboard for one flight is pretty quick and easy. But then when you have to collect the forms for a week's worth of flights, somebody has to try and decipher the messy handwriting and track down any missing information, that can all be a pretty major source of frustration. So we eliminate all that busy work with FileMaker Go. Um, the remote users are entering the data in real time and there is no deciphering messy handwriting later. And then just because you can doesn't mean you should. So balancing cool with cost effective, we look at whether or not a particular feature is going to save time and money. If not, and it takes more than a few minutes to do, then we'll just put that off until later. We may decide that it's just never going to be worth the time and effort, uh, no matter how much we might enjoy the challenge as a developer. It's easy to get distracted but you have to try and focus on the ROI, the, the return on investment. It limit the fun stuff that has marginal value, value to the overall process and really focus on the highest value first. So we're gonna take a look at the um, Ascend Aviation system here and I'm going to transition over to FileMaker and, oops, sorry, I'm gonna transition over to Keynote in this case because I have this running on my iPad. So Keynote allows me to present my iPad directly here on my Mac, and I have a sample flight set up for you showing three stops. I'm going from KTEB airport code to KHOU and back to KTEB. So when we click on this, I'm just tapping this with my fingertip, and here we can see the details of this flight. Obviously, I have a lot of um, detailed information here, including time zone differences. And um, what you're looking at here, this is the uh, second generation of this FileMaker solution. And Brian developed the original, uh, much of it himself, but he called us to, to have me help him with the more complex issues. The time zones and daylight savings time around the world um, we have an internal routine in this system that checks a web service on a regular schedule to look for revised starting and ending dates for daylight savings. And you, you may not have thought that this information would change all that, all that often, 
but I, I actually remember a time not that long ago when uh, Vicente, Vicente Fox was the president of Mexico. He decided a month before the start of daylight savings that they just weren't going to observe daylight savings that year. And if we had a bunch of printed itineraries floating around, that obviously presents a problem. We would have to go and replace them all for our passengers. So having this electronic, it's much easier. Save it to PDF, send it out, and we're ready to go. We're also um, estimating the flight time based on not only the plane, but the direction of the flight. So to know if we have a headwind or a tailwind, we can automatically calculate that behind the scenes and do all these complex formulas and, and get really professional results, what you would expect out of a commercial airline system right here in a file maker based solution. Um, and, and now this second round of development was a complete redesign of this interface to make it better for the iPad. So um, we've added some features and some reporting in that second round and we consolidated two solutions into one. He was tracking his flight expenses separate from his flight details, so the passenger itineraries and all of that. Um, but if we take a look at some of the other tabs here, if we go over to flight details, here's where we would record, record how many gallons of fuel we used for this flight and the price that we paid. And one of the cool things about FileMaker Go is that I can say what kind of keyboard I want to pop up on the, uh, the iPad based on the nature of the information that I expect to have in that field. So here I know that I'm only going to um, enter numbers for the price that I paid, so I can use just a basic numeric keypad. As a different type of field, I've just changed this for display purposes. In the top field, we could pop up a little, uh, you know, a phone keypad instead of a basic numeric keypad. And we can obviously pop up a full text keyboard as well. But now going over to the crew, here um, it was important that the role of the individuals be consistent with the order in which they were shown in the list. So these orange, or I'm sorry, the green buttons on the left, um, we can reposition the crew members. And when we do, we have a little convenience feature built in here as well. Um, because I'm using this on the iPad, I don't want to do a lot of data entry. I don't want to do a lot of typing. I want the system to, to think for me. So if I move Bill up to the top position and replace Brian, I see that now Bill, his role has also been promoted to captain and Brian has been changed to co-captain. So the system does that for me automatically when I reposition these, these two crew members. And we would have flight attendants listed here as well. So that's the basic idea. And like I said, the, uh, the interface looks the same through FileMaker Pro, FileMaker Go, and FileMaker Web Direct. We've used this same layout on all three devices and, and the sizing of all the objects has been developed precisely to be touch friendly and also work with a, the keyboard and mouse on a regular desktop computer. So now if we switch back to our presentation, oops, sorry, and I'm going to hide that so it doesn't pop up later. And now we move on to our second case study, McConnell's Fine Ice Creams. This is a fun one. I like ice cream. <laughs> uh, McConnell's they have uh, you know fine ice creams that are made with local, sustainable, and organic raw materials. They, they source their materials from partner farms and artisans and purveyors that they've worked with for decades. So they, they really do have a passion for their products and for their customers. And um, they have various locations throughout California. They've been in business for over 65 years and they, they serve the public through scoop shops, regular ice cream establishment uh, where you would go in and order a cone of ice cream. Uh, but they also have what they call their Mick truck. This is the picture at the top right. And you can rent this truck for any, um, any big party that you're going to have or a Mick cart on the right with a red umbrella. You can rent those as well. They also have a catering service. And um, in the office, they track all their orders in QuickBooks, but they were looking to, to streamline their local deliveries. And they deliver locally to fine dining restaurants. So they needed a mobile FileMaker-based solution to solve that problem and eliminate the inefficient paper pushing. So the paper forms here on the left, you can see what they were accustomed to using when recording the orders from their customers. They fill out the quantities, 
in the grids that you see there. And as, since they hated updating the form, they actually started adding new flavors and just put the names of those new flavors in the comments section on the right, which then obviously leads to the problems with data collection because they didn't have them in the grid where they should have been. So they didn't, they may not have known that one of these new flavors was not, avail uh, was not available in pint size containers. It was only available in a two and a half gallon containers or you know, something like that. So we wanted to reduce the training burden. Um, we wanted to uh, increase user satisfaction by sticking with something that works. We didn't want to go with a, a traditional database look and feel. We wanted something that would just be instantly recognizable for them. So what we did was we maintained a familiar experience by just taking their form and building it into FileMaker. Um, this is the FileMaker Pro, FileMaker Go. Again, this same layout used on the iPad and uh, in FileMaker Go and in FileMaker Pro on the desktop. So which, by using the paper as the guide, we didn't have to train them. They already knew the process. Um, but we also eliminated a pain point because they no longer had to update the form. We're pulling this information directly from QuickBooks. So when new flavors are added in QuickBooks, we have a server-based routine that pulls in their new products and their new container sizes and automatically draws them in the right positions on the form based on whether it's a, a seasonal flavor or a premium sorbet or if it's just a traditional flavor. The tool that we're using there behind the scenes is called QODBC, and the really cool thing about this is that it allows our FileMaker server to talk directly to QuickBooks, and um, using SQL syntax through an ODBC connection, lots of tricky stuff there, but um, really nice result so that we can just have scheduled scripts that automatically transfer the data between the two systems for us. So we've built this mobile front end to QuickBooks using FileMaker Go. Now, obviously, you know, we discussed that one of the challenges was that we wanted to make it less cumbersome than QuickBooks. And here on the left-hand side, you can see what the packing slip screen looks like in QuickBooks and what their actual product codes look like. And they would have to look for, you know, if they wanted a burgundy cherry two and a half gallon container, they would have to know that that's product code SB 2.5G SBT burgundy cherry. Seems obvious to us, right? And so, we want to make sure that we're showing only what the user needs to be able to complete their current task and allow them to enter it in a familiar format and hide all of that cryptic product and account code and all that other stuff that makes QuickBooks work. But we also wanted to eliminate any of the communication difficulties so that the, the delivery driver always has the latest and greatest information as soon as it's available to the main office. And um, so once the data is entered on the iPad, everyone has access to the same data the automatic handoff behind the scenes with no manual intervention, it, we've tremendously reduced the amount of effort involved in recording and fulfilling the orders. So I'm going to switch over to FileMaker here this time, and we're going to take a look at this solution. Um, as I said, it looks just like the, the paper form. And the reason I'm showing this in FileMaker Pro instead of FileMaker Go is that I can zoom in on it more easily. Um, this, for this particular solution, we did recommend a stylus to be used with the iPad so that it's easy, easier to tap on the boxes in the field. And uh, it's also easier to collect a signature. At the end of uh, this little tour here, I'm going to show you, we pop up a signature box for the, the customer. and I've tried signing on, on uh, touch devices before with my fingertip and it just does not feel natural at all. Since I've been signing my name with a, a pen for so many years, signing with my fingertip just doesn't feel right. So a stylus is kind of the perfect hybrid solution there. Uh, but we also have some in automated intelligence built into this form so that if you were to click on one of these gray boxes and put in a quantity, It'll tell you that that um, product is not available in that container size. But here we see that we've ordered a two and a half gallon Brazilian coffee chip. And all I have to do as the delivery driver to say that I've delivered this product to this customer is check the box. And when I do that, 
it automatically updates the, the status of my order in the top right. So now you can see that my status is delivered. And uh, it's yellow telling me that there's something left to do. Before I leave this customer, I also click on this box and I get the signature region where I can then have the user with their stylus sign their name to confirm uh, receipt of the goods. That button will then automatically turn green after I've collected the signature telling me that the order is complete. And before, before I had delivered that item, you can see that that box is red. So just using um, immediately recognizable cues in the interface so the user knows what's happening. And I'm going to close that and we can hide this and switch back to Keynote. And now we'll talk about our third case study. So SNG Seeds. Um, SNG Seeds is a, uh, they, they're in the field of contract production of seeds from growers to shipment across the Midwest. And they've been around for almost 100 years. They're now on the third and fourth generations. And those family members you can see in the photo there on the right. So this is a very big part of who they are as a family and, and obviously as a, an extended family. And they were one of the early producers of hybrid, hybrid corn in the 1930s. And in, the, that, in that time, this was a transformative technology where they actually took, uh, they intentionally cross-pollinated different strains of corn so they would get a higher yield and stronger root system, which made the plants more resistant to wind and cold and drought. And we think about technology today as computers. Techn technology then had a very different form. And they were really pioneers in the technology in that field of, of their day. And so they've had exposure to technology for many generations. And um, their, their general focus is still on coordinating the transfer of inventory from contract growers to buyers. They have a network of growers. And they just have to make sure that the product gets to uh, the buyers who need those seeds. So here's the mechanism that they were using internally to facilitate their order fulfillment. And this is the paper form that they would print out for the order in their office and then physically walk it over to the warehouse. And uh, one of, I believe, six warehouses that they have on site. And then the warehouse workers would pull the, uh, pull the goods off the shelves and load the trucks and mark off what they've collected and bring it back over to the office to say that it's ready to go. So there's no validation or enforcement of business rules with paper. You can see on this form, some of these lines have a dash in them. I don't know if that dash means that they found it in inventory or they did not find it in inventory. Does it need to go on another truck later? Or uh, was it shipped previously on a different order? And luckily, when I look a little deeper at this form, I can see that that means that they're really just talking about the boxes that they had to use to load the products into and um, get them onto the trucks. So in that case, I don't have to worry about the boxes, but I kind of would have liked to have known, did they really use 10 boxes to load the second uh, stop? Because I want to keep track of my inventory overall to know, is it time to order more boxes? And we're not getting that sense of information here for, from these paper forms. Um, but I also have no idea how many bags are left of any particular seed in any warehouse location. So. I don't know if there was any damage when we were loading the truck, and uh, there's no indication of, uh, you know, shrinkage of inventory. So I also like the technical uh, process that they use here for reordering the stops. If you look at stop number one on the left, it was originally one. They just crossed it out and wrote in the number three. And that's how they've rearranged their route for the day. So does the office know that they've rearranged their route? Probably not in this case. So those are some of the various challenges that we experience with paper. Um, so the paper-based fulfillment process often delayed order fulfillment by up to a day and a half. And that's pretty significant when you're trying to run the, uh, such a large organization and the volume that they're dealing with. Um, the, the process of transferring the forms from the office to the warehouse and back might have been a good fitness program for the company. but definitely wasted a lot of time. And now when we get down to the last problem here of accidentally printing two copies of the same order, 
with a high volume of order fulfillment, it's easy to miss that you accidentally have two copies. And then those two copies get over to, the, uh, to one of the six warehouses and maybe even went to two different warehouses. But then those two orders also got loaded onto trucks and those two trucks then showed up for the same customer with two copies of that delivery or you know, uh, two full deliveries. That's a pretty costly mistake, not just in lost profit, but in lost credibility. And you know, with a family run business, credibility is very, very important. So let's now um, take a look at this solution. If we switch back over to FileMaker, we're gonna fill our orders and um, gonna take a look at this order here. Just go in and edit my details. And I wanna show you a little trick that we used here in FileMaker. Um, this is a FileMaker Go based solution. It's intended to be used on the iPad. But I'm going to show it here because I think you'll, you'll see the trick a little better than you would if I was simply rotating the iPad. On the instructions here on the layout, we see something that says rotate to enter the pick quantity. So this is for the person in the warehouse who's fulfilling the order and they know that they need um, eight of this particular item. So they're gonna go to aisle 717 in the warehouse and they're going to enter how many they, they took from that location in the warehouse for that particular lot number. And if I was to rotate my iPad, I have more width when I go to the landscape view than I do when I'm in the portrait view. So what we're looking at now is the portrait view. And if I put my cursor over the right side of the window here and I just stretch the window, you'll see that this other field, this other column, just automatic, automatically appears on the right hand side where I can enter additional information. So if I was just to rotate the iPad, it would pop into place and I would see this extra column. And this is how I can cleverly use extra screen real estate for the two different orientations of the iPad. And the way we're doing this here is that we're just using one layout and we've anchored the, the fields on that rightmost column to the right side of the window. And then uh, as the window grows, they slide out from under the items that are stacked above them and appear for the users so they can enter the data. We've actually done the same thing on the home screen. If we go over here, um, you see this, the photograph of the farm and as we change the orientation of the iPad, we're just showing more or less of that picture by allowing the picture to slide behind these other layout elements. Um, so nice little, now that may fall under the fun category on the menu screen, but on the data entry layout, it falls under the productive category because it gives us the ability to show all of the data on a single layout and get different behavior um, that, that's very intuitive to the user. So our final case study is Penny Newman Grain. And um, the Penny Newman Grain Company, they've been in business for over 135 years. This is a very well established company. And um, they serve farmers and feed manufacturers in the international market for grains um, and, and feed byproducts. So they have locations in California, Tennessee, uh, sorry, Tennessee, Mississippi, and Georgia. The, our specific project was based with the uh, liquid feed division for dairies in California. And they have more than two million gallons of liquid storage at a bulk cargo terminal. So that uh, gives you a sense of the volume that we're dealing with here. That's a, a lot of molasses. It's a lot of bitter feed for um, mixing in with the molasses for our, our cattle feed. Um, but the other industries that they, they deal with, they've done uh, working with byproducts. If you look at the, uh, the rice hulls, that is harvested from uh, you know, processing the crops, that material can actually be used for pillow stuffing and uh, can also be used for powering steam engines. So a couple of creative uses of what may have previously been, been considered waste. The walnut shells, the, um, the shells themselves can actually be ground down and used as a blast media similar to sandblasting, but it doesn't scratch or pit the surface that they're cleaning and it doesn't cause harmful lung conditions. So this organization, they've been in business for so long that they can focus on refinement and refinement to get more and more profit and make sure that they're using every possible efficiency 
to run the organization as a whole. Um, but they have an extens extensive storage and transportation network, and they've dealt with products ranging from planting seeds all the way down to the trays that are used for drying raisins uh, when after harvesting. And um, their, their clients obviously have a variety of products and services that they receive from them. So our challenge here was to figure out how much to feed the cattle. And it doesn't seem like that difficult of a problem. I, I never would have guessed that feeding cows was such a complicated process. To start out, you just have to know how many cows and how many days. And that's pretty easy. But then for optimal growth in milk production, you have to have a very precise amount of sweetness in the, the feed mix. And if you're mixing powder in with a liquid feed, then you get to yet another formula. So you may have to pump out some of the feed that's already there remaining in the trough from the last time you were there to fill and uh, mix back in a certain amount of sweet fill, a certain amount of bitter fill, and um, get just the right result. So when we do that, the calculations obviously get much more complicated. And these are some of the intermediate calculations showing on the left side of this slide, the, some of the intermediate values that actually go into figuring out the exact ratio that we need for the result. So here's where they started. Uh, when we first started working with them, the dealers who visit these individual dairies have a bunch of feed on their trucks and they have to figure out how much to pump into the trough, how much sweet, how much bitter, and how much powder. So this is a paper form where obviously they can record all the visits on the same form. So this form uh, might sit in a clipboard in the delivery guy's truck. Uh, calculation errors occurred quite often and they were pretty time consuming to verify, but you can see that they've crossed some out and wrote in different numbers and made some notes there, but there was no ability to analyze the data or look at any sort of trends um, and proactively serve the customers. And this is actually the best case scenario because oftentimes the, uh, the delivery drivers didn't write down any information at all. They may have done the calculations by hand, pumped in the feed they needed and left and didn't write down any of the numbers. Or if they did write down the numbers, it might have been on some sort of uh, you know, scrap of paper that they found in the truck as a receipt from someplace else that they had purchased something. So the dealers didn't have an actual ac accurate reflection of what was happening, and neither did Penny Newman, the parent organization who was providing the materials to the dealers. So they started losing dealers because this was just such a complex process, and they, they didn't have any good systems, and the dealers were getting frustrated. The, the technology just wasn't living up to the task. So again, we turned to FileMaker Pro and FileMaker Go. And in this case, we now have yet another iPad solution and it's distributed to the dealers. And these dealers are not employees of Penny Newman. So we had to reduce the training burden as much as possible. We needed comfortable screens that were um, going to improve the user acceptance. And we wanted the users to be able to just enter a few different measurements and automatically calculate out everything for them to tell them exactly what they needed to pump off from the truck. Or if they had to pump out the trough and mix in new, new material, this system tells them exactly what to do. So the representatives from Penny Newman were able to introduce this system at one of their dealer meetings before they rolled it out to, um, to their entire user base. It, it was enthusiastically welcomed as a differentiator in the market because the handheld technology of the day was seriously lacking and the handheld technology being a calculator that was developed many many years ago this iPad solution is generations uh, beyond what was available to them previously so the they record the measurements locally on the iPad and that gives them the automatic calculation results they need but then we also synchronize their iPad back to the main office using a uh, a third-party product called MirrorSync whenever they get a good internet connection. So they have this information on their iPad, maybe they get back to the office later in the day, or they get to a, a local coffee shop that offers free Wi-Fi, they can synchronize their data back to the main office, and everybody has all the information they need. They can run proactive um, trending reports to serve, better serve their customers. 
so as a quick review, these are the four markets we've talked about. Ascend Aviation, the flight and passenger details in the clouds. These are the real clouds. These are not the, the nebulous cloud that's uh, internet based. So recording passenger information and flight information right in the cockpit. Uh, McConnell's ice cream, doing local deliveries of ice cream, getting their signature capture where needed, making sure that the order information is being collected properly and um, that the information is flowing in real time. SNG Seeds, they have trouble overcoming their inventory challenges and making their internal processes much more efficient and preventing duplicate deliveries. But then also um, our last one here, Penny Newman Grain, feeding the cattle without a pot pocket protector, um, it, that has changed my perception of cattle feed forever. So it's a variety of markets and a variety of needs. They, they all started out with paper and they were all able to eliminate paper, improve productivity and increase profits with custom database solutions that were built in FileMaker Pro and used in FileMaker Go and FileMaker Web Direct. So I'm going to wrap up here with just some information about Excelsis and um, just let you know that it, we're an in, international organization. Uh, we specialize in custom applications for web, mobile, and desktop deployment. Whether you're migrating an old system or starting something from scratch, we can build it for you or we can help you through the process of building it yourself. We work with FileMaker Pro, FileMaker Go, WebDirect, SQL, QuickBooks integration, um, Excel spreadsheets, anything you need, iPhone and iPad integration, various databases and web technologies and frameworks. Um, and you may have also heard about our, our Biz Tracker solution. The original version of the FileMaker Business Tracker was developed by Excelsis for FileMaker Inc. back in 2007. Uh, hard to believe that that was seven years ago, but for the release of FileMaker Pro 7. And um, it's a good fit for small and mid-sized organizations who sell any type of product or service. And it, it's a robust, scalable FileMaker solution with multi-user access, and it can easily be modified and adapted to any business need. We also pride ourselves on giving uh, the development community, community free trips, tips and tricks. Uh, we have various articles and demos on our website, so feel free to check them out at Excelsis.com, and I want to thank you all for your time today. And Mark, I'll hand the reins back to you. Doug, thank you so much. That was a, a wonderful presentation on your four customer business use cases. Um, very nice job. All right, so for the remainder of the time, we're going to answer some of the questions uh, that you've been submitting to our online chat. Um, before we jump into the Q&A portion, um, on the screen now, you see a couple of FileMaker resources. I get a chance to write down these URLs. Um, this is a great area to go and, and get more information about FileMaker, especially if you enjoyed what you saw today. Um, we do have more customer success stories out there, um, like the ones you heard today from, from Doug. Um, so please go check those out. And, and every week we have new web seminars, just like the paper replacement uh, webinar that you attended today. And of course, the last URL that I'll mention is the training resources, um, especially for the new folks that are new to the FileMaker world. We've got a section called FileMaker Training Series, and there's um, some on online training that you could take advantage of um, for free, FileMaker Training Series Basics. It's a way to download and, and really learn on your own um, if that's what you like to do. All right, let's jump into the Q&A section. And I'm going to have Doug and team help me out with some of the uh, answers to these questions. Okay, first question that came up. For barcode scanning, do we need to purchase a scanner or can I use our iPad with FileMaker Go? Um, so, good question. Uh, FileMaker Go does have built-in uh, barcode scanning. You can use it on the iPad or the iPhone. Uh, we have clients using that successfully today and uh, in one environment where it's a uh, inventory warehousing um, or sorry warehouse inventory solution where they audit the inventory uh, works very well it all depends on the volume of barcodes that you want to scan and what sort of uh, you know how fast you have to be able to do that devices that are optimized for barcode scanning will obviously give you results faster than a built-in camera in the iPad or um, the iPhone but it can be done straight in iOS devices using FileMaker Go Thanks, Doug. Next question. Does the FileMaker connection to QuickBooks 
allow you to write data both ways. Example, from FileMaker to QuickBooks and vice versa. Absolutely. This, um, this QODBC product is uh, available in two different flavors. So you can use, you can purchase the read-only version and the read-only version comes um, free with QuickBooks Enterprise. But if you buy it as an add-on, you can get the read-write version so you can push and pull. Um, it absolutely does work both ways. Great. Next question. Where can we find industry-specific templates well, I'll take that uh, question, Doug. Um, I'm going to point you guys to FileMaker.com under Solutions Made for FileMaker section, and you could query it by specific industry. Um, another idea is FileMaker out of the box comes with uh, about 16 starter solutions now. So if you're, you're looking just to get started with FileMaker and you want to manage certain aspects like your contacts, your inventory, we've got starter solutions where we've kind of done the work for you, but you could also customize these templates as well. So those are, those are two ideas that you could take away um, regarding industry-specific type templates. Next question. For security concerns, can FileMaker Go connect to servers that are behind a firewall? Yes, and um, it's just a matter of properly configuring the firewall. So um, FileMaker uses port 5003. As long as you open port 5003 and allow that to push through your firewall and directly to your FileMaker server, then your outside traffic can come in directly without using a VPN. Uh, VPN is obviously another option. You can have them join the network and then just use uh, internal communication within the firewall to allow that connectivity as well. Great. And Doug, this, this question is specifically about your four business use cases. Do all of your solutions use a central server? Did you have any problems with offline access when the iPad user has poor or limited connection? Great question. And actually, the fourth one does, uh, does not connect live to the hosted server because these dairy farms were in such remote areas. and. Um, some of them did not have good enough internet. Um, the other three case studies do connect to the live server, so we didn't have to worry about any synchronization issues. But for offline connectivity with the Penny Newman solution, we are using Mirror Sync to collect the data locally. Um, that's collecting the data is all just done with um, vanilla FileMaker features, and then we use Mirror Sync to replicate the data to the back office once we get the connectivity we need. Okay, great. Uh, next question. Can you please share more details on how to capture a handwritten signature on the iPad? Uh, yeah, the, that's just set as an input type on a container field that um, in FileMaker Pro you just say that you want that to be a signature field. Um, so you can insert that and once they click into the field just write with, with, a, with a stylus or a fingertip and it's just it's stored as a graphic. Perfect. And, and for folks on the phone, um, we've got a webinar called Introduction to FileMaker, where um, a sales rep like myself will go ahead and build a solution in FileMaker Pro, extend it out to the iPad, and show you how to build in that signature capture for your mobile device. It's, it's actually very easy to use and, and to create. Next question. For data captured in the field on an iPad without a mobile data plan, will the real-time real data be sent back to the office the next time a Wi-Fi wi connection is made? And will, and will that update the collected data in the office? So that seems like a sync question to me, Doug. Why don't you go ahead and take that? Yeah, it, um, it doesn't happen automatically um, as soon as you connect. The... Um, the, the actual experience there is that once you get the connection back, the, um, the user would click a button that says that they explicitly want to synchronize the information. And that'll do the, the bi-directional data transfer once they start that scripted process. And um, then we take the information that was entered in the field and push it back to the server, but then we can also take some information that was collected in the main office and push it down to the remote device as well to let them know that they may have a, a, a new stop that just came in, was added to their route, and have to change where they're going next. So 
Um, it doesn't happen as soon as you plug in. It doesn't happen as soon as you get a Wi-Fi connection. But if the user clicks the button, then the automated process takes care of it. Great. And uh, l let me actually throw in just a, a little bit additional information on that. Um, it, it's always based, your, your synchronization or your connection methodology is always based on uh, not only your need, uh, but also your, lo your locale. Um, in many of our solutions, we're connecting directly to the server over a, a cellular connection on the on the iPad. Uh, in some cases, we're we're using a synchronized uh, so that we have offline access, and it is based on on how frequently you need to to get the information, and then obviously if you have uh, Wi-Fi or cellular capabilities out in the particular fields. Uh, in the situation with Penny Newman, for example, uh, because these are dealers who don't actually work for, they're not employees of Penny Newman, uh, the dealers are responsible for getting their own iPads, um, they're responsible for their own data plans and, and things of that nature. Uh, and of course, as Doug said, you know, they're going out to cattle farms where you, you, in many cases in California, you know, you do still have a pretty good cellular coverage. But you are in the middle of a field somewhere. Uh, you don't necessarily have a great signal. So the need there was, was more important for them to be able to capture the data. And they didn't really need any sort of real-time capability. So they were able to you know, do what they need to do, capture the data, do their calculations and everything, go on to the next field, repeat it. And then when they get back to the office or uh, a coffee shop or home or, or what have you, they can just synchronize at that point uh, and, and be ready to go, and that way everything is updated. And that was, again, all based on the, the particular needs of the project and also the, the locale and the technology that they had available. Thank you. Next question. Can Excel Assist share any information on time frame for these solutions from meeting with the client to finish solution? And my guess is all four were probably different time frames. So, Doug, why don't you maybe explain that? Actually, yeah. I'll go Actually well, it, um, I'll, I'll jump in on one, and then I'm going to hand it off to Christo to finish with the rest. But on the first one, Ascend Aviation, uh, I mentioned that Brian did a little bit of the development work himself, and, um, you know, he loves FileMaker, loves developing in FileMaker. It was a lot of fun for him. But the entire um, process of building his first solution and then redeveloping his two initial solutions and consolidating them into one and getting that all bundled up in an iPad-friendly interface, um, we spent in total less than 50 hours on development um, throughout the span of the work that we did with him. So uh, for time on the books with Ascend Aviation, we're at under 50 hours and Christo, you want to talk about some of the others? Yeah, I'll talk uh, specifically a little bit about Penny Newman. Uh, Penny Newman was an interesting case because they had approached us about a year ago with this concept. Somebody at the company decided they wanted to branch out and do something new and different. But the proof of concept that was originally designed, I think we spent somewhere about around 75 to hours. And then the uh, project got poo pooed by corporate. And then a year later, they came back and they wanted to keep continue on with the production of it once they started realizing they were having issues with dealers. I think but once the time we, the proof of concept was finished and it was completed, I think we had it done within a matter of a couple of months. Um, as far as S and G, uh, that's been an ongoing perfecting process. Um, and Adam McConnell's, what did you spend on that one? I think that took you initially, what, about two or three weeks to come up with the initial concept, Doug? Why don't you figure yeah. out? Yeah, McConnell's was, uh, that was a fun project for me because I, my, uh, I have a lot of experience with QuickBooks integrations in general and I've done that for over 10 years now. So personally, uh, I really wanted to get involved in the project. I loved uh, the opportunity to work with QODBC and this different way of integrating with QuickBooks and um, I'm pretty sure we have less than 25 hours on the books with McConnell's. One point two I want to make about all of these um, case studies that we've shown here um, which is a big key factor for a lot of people uh, considering going paperless. These are task-specific <laughs> solutions that we've done. These were designed so that the tasks at hand would be fixed and modernized. Um, and and that, that plays a huge role. We, we have a lot of people who have come to us, clients and prospects, who, are, who think that 
the requirement is to change their entire solution needs to be mobile based or web based and that's not necessarily the case every time. We have found through uh, our, our method of assessment and our agile development that we segment out or task orient those those case studies, those, those features, those functionalities for people to use. So that you're not having to develop an entire solution that needs to be broadcast out or run remotely, so to speak. The other thing too is that a lot of these solutions, once they're deployed, you know, the people that have the vision, uh, it's a 50-50 relationship we have with our client, we bring the technology and the experience and know-how, but they bring their business to us. And one of the key factors on all these solutions is they have an idea of what things they want to do, we have a way of making it work, but when we collaborate and as this process unfolds, as you introduce different types of users who think differently or who actually are more involved with the day-to-day -day tasks, there has been perfecting and tweaking and polishing done. So you're never going to always hit out of the park right out of the gate. So these have all been through a process of back and forth usage. Penny Newman stuff out in the field, having the dealers deal with it, how they use it, what, what issues they came across till we came to a perfect solution. So they, they, it's like any software. You're going to go through your alpha, your beta, then your final. Yeah, and the collaboration is key in that process. It's, it's huge to you know, work, with, work with a client as a partner in, in their business. Great, guys. Thank, thank you for the explanation. We have time for one more question. Last one is, can FileMaker 13 print out barcodes as well as reading them? Uh, yeah, printing barcodes, there are a variety of different ways of dealing with that. Um, it could be as simple as just getting the right font. Um, there are Mac and Windows fonts available for barcodes that um, Code 39 or Code 128, different barcode technologies, as long as you have that font on your system and you're printing it from FileMaker Pro, then all you really need to do is show a, a number or a string of text on screen and format it with the right font. It'll come out looking exactly like the barcode that you uh, would expect. If you're doing it from an iPad, you can't load the fonts on there as easily, so um, you, you could either offload that to the, to the server or one of the office users, or um, there's a third-party tool for creating barcodes using web viewers. Um, the other possibility is that we have a tip file on the Excelsis.com website about creating a Code39 barcode just using repeating fields in FileMaker. So there are a variety of different ways to do that, and um, we'd be happy to help anyone with uh, implementing that in their own solution. Excellent. Well, thank you again, everybody, for attending our webinar, and we'll see you soon. Thank you again.